So good morning and welcome to Women and Movement number 11, African American Women Affecting the Arts in New Orleans. Dance. Uh, I want to start, I've been thinking about Ntozaki Shange a lot lately, so I want to start with a little Ntozaki Shange from her choreo poem um, for colored girls who were considered suicide from the rainbow was enough. And say, we got to dance to keep from crying. We got to dance to keep from dying. So come on, come on. With solemn gratitude, we are here again together in person after a few years of not being together. Um, I want to give gratitude to the earth beneath, beneath us and the atmosphere around us, the land, the tribes of the Gulf South region, the Choctaw, Chinimacha, Biloxi, Homa, Kashada peoples, with humble gratitude to all our African ancestors and the people of African descent in the Gulf South region. We are here. <clears throat> Listening to black women requires art and skill. Black women have something to say. Black women are leaders. Black women are present and visible. Black women are movers and shakers. Over six years ago, a graduate student helped support the vision that Executive Director of New Orleans Center for the Gulf South, Rebecca Snedeker, had to showcase women of the Gulf South region and how their creative work intersects with supporting our Gulf South community. That graduate student is actually on the stage, and her name is Jarrell Hamilton. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Um, I'll just try to project. Um, over the 11 iterations, I'm looking to the place for that. Thank you. Thank you for doing the research to make this happen. Um, over the 11 iterations of Women in Movement, we have hosted incredible artists and scholars like Nana Sula, Spirit McIntyre, Wendy Moore-Neal, Asali Ecclesiastes, Devan, Gia Hamilton, Stella Jones, Dr. Lady Hubbard, Keisha McKee, Stephanie McKee-Anderson, Lisa, Lisa Alexis, Dr. Courtney Bryan, Sultana Isham, Natasha Bundy, Ms. Doreen Ketchens, Queen Cherise Harrison Nelson, Gia Tolentino, Anna Krieger Benson, and um, Marissa Joseph and Cheeky Black, just to name a few. And we are here again, held by the incredible moderation of Lauren Turner Hines to celebrate and hear from these incredible, incredible and powerful women. This could not have been possible without the support of New Orleans Center for the Gulf South. Executive Director Re uh, Rebecca Snedeker, Executive Secretary Regina Cairns, graduate student Demi Ward, and myself. We also thank Dr. John Ray Proctor for his partnership in African American Women <coughs> Arts and Humanities. Thank you to Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs and Multicultural <coughs> Affairs, Carolyn Barber Pierre, Juliana Argentino, and Ariel Pintis from the School of Liberal Arts, the EDI Office, the Africana Studies Program, NOLA for Women, Music Rising at Tulane, and TU Libraries, especially Alan Velasquez and Lisa Luber. I will now introduce Dr. John Ray Proctor. Dr. John Ray Proctor is an assistant <laughs> professor of theater at Tulane, where he teaches acting. Um, he holds a PhD in theater research from the University of Wisconsin Madison. He's interviewed Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Lynn Nottage, author Zachary Lazar, and producer Sarah Kinney at Tulane University. He's the creator, developer, and producer in conjunction with New Orleans Center for the Gulf South of the annual forum African American Women Affecting the Arts in New Orleans. I give you Dr. John Ray Proctor. Good morning. I am humbled and happy to uh, invite this host of truly beautiful women uh, into the Department of Theater and Dance to have this discussion today. Um, I was raised in a matriarch. My mother raised me. I knew my grandmother. My mother was the second eldest of seven children, and she raised her siblings, and I knew my great-grandmother. Um, I was raised in a world where I got to sit in the kitchen as my mother and her sisters and my aunts made Thanksgiving dinner. I had been listening to women talk my entire life. 
and I have been blessed by the stories, and I know that that that's where my ancestors are held. So, without further ado, I I I will take a moment to introduce the panelists. Then I'm gonna stop talking. Uh, I'd like to begin by introducing uh, Greer Goff Mendy, director of Tecrima Center for Center for Arts and Culture. Asechua Amor Amenkum, big queen of the Wichita. Thank you. I'm from up north. I'm oh, used to yeah. being corrected. <laughs> the Washita Nation Big Indian Tribe, artistic director and founding member of Kumbuka African Drum and Dance Collective. Mariama Curry, founder, yes. artistic director yes. of Kulu and, and Kafu, traditional African dance companies. And Kumbu. And Kumbu? Kulu. Kulu. Thank you. Kai Knight, artistic director of Silhouette Dance Ensemble and Bree, choreographer and performer and instructor, Kumbulu, African Drum and Dance Collective, Bambula 2000. Jarell Hamilton, founder and director of Jarell Hamilton Inc. And De La Soul Performance Company. And De La Soul Performance <laughs> Company. <laughs> and we are blessed that this panel will be moderated by Miss Lauren Turner, artistic director and founder of No Dream Deferred No. Mm -hmm. The floor All is right. yours. All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I am so excited. I, I've been thrilled um, ever since I was invited to moderate this panel because I too was that child who sat on the floor in the kitchen listening. Some people would say uh, snooping, but I love to hear, I love to sit um, and listen to especially black women talk about not just their lives, but also their, their artistic practice. Um, um, so one of the things I wanna do first though, is I just wanna acknowledge that we are here and we're gonna have this wonderful conversation, but we are doing this. And the only reason we're able to do this is because we have access to land, right? We have access to land that's been stolen. Um, and I just want to name and lift up the Homa, Choctaw and Chitty Macha peoples um, who have, uh, whose land we're on, right? And I also want to acknowledge uh, stolen labor. I want to acknowledge uh, my ancestors um, of the Wolof and Bambara people of Senegal and the Gambia, whose blood um, is in the soil and whose uh, have basically culturally shaped this place. Um, and so I want to lift that up today and I want to set acknowledgement as a very meaningful intervention, but it's a first step and there are actions that can accompany acknowledgement, actions looking like supporting um, land sovereignty for indigenous people, um, supporting um, um, the um, um, black leadership, supporting um, anti-racist policies and practices um, that um, push forward equality and equity. Um, so there are things that we have to do beyond acknowledgement. Um, so I just wanna say that first and foremost and give honor and encourage everyone in here to, to think through in this moment and beyond um, why we're able to do the things we're, do we're doing, whose land we're on. Um, there is no empty space and there's always stories that come um, before ours began. Um, so with that said, let's jump right into it. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And let's give it up one more time for uh, Dr. Proctor, Dr. Frazier, Nola Gove South, and all of our illustrious um, panelists. So I'm gonna ask that we start by just having each person describe their own artistic practice. What you I'm sorry, what? Okay, don't start with you. Okay. <laughs> so we can go, we can come from this way with Miss Kai Knight. Um, describe, we love to hear it in your own words, how you would describe it. Um, that's a layered question. Um, I love dance and from that perspective that where dance for me is healing, it's a way of life, it, it's my voice. I um, also um, love to, can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Um, 
I, I <laughs> the question was, what's my practice? Yeah, describe your own artistic. Practice. Um, I am a dancer, but I I really love to teach dance and choreograph and be. A, I'm a chore, choreographer. Um, I teach mainly in the realm of African diaspora, um, Afro modern, um, but I also dibble dabble in different other um, art forms and disciplines. And I love. Um, one of my companies is a multi generational company where we have the youth dancing with the old with their uh, their elders. Um, I love that kind of melting pot. So I can say pretty much I live in that area where we create community amongst the dancers, um, and we go out go out to show how we operate. But it's the way we live. It is part of the performance, but it's how we practice. And there's a lot more, but I don't want to talk that way. <laughs> well, to the elders, do I have permission to speak? Go ahead on, girl. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> I know Tulane endorsed me to be here because of my gift, but my elders is always going to let me know if my character is out of place. And if your character is out of place, you're not welcome to speak. So that's what we do in our afternoon. African-American community. So to get to your question, uh, my creative practice, um, I am an artistic director and choreographer, uh, interdisciplinary artist in De La Soul Performance Dance Company. What we do is embody African-American stories and histories of our people through interdisciplinary forms, dance, film, um, theater, and we process that through abstract narratives um, at the intersection of spirituality, identity, and culture. I also I am also the founder of Jarrell Hamilton Inc., now known as T Bean Productions, um, which is um, we support, we present, and we create original interdisciplinary works and cultural works. Um, and right now, our cultural programming that we have is a Spark Grant initiative where we give $1,000 to an artist to their artistic endeavors. Uh, we have a TB mental wellness program um, where we, ages 8 to 16, the students come to do holistic programming uh, rooted in mental health services as well as cultural arts. And then we put on productions and we did our first production in November. 2022 entitled watercolors and um yeah my life's work is healing my life's work is elevation my life's work is um yeah just doing god's work that's me you want me to come behind that <laughs> check check it's on, it's on. i'm looking for the monitor tech person that's what i was looking for the monitor so, how I describe my life's work? I begin by just saying, Ishe Oluwa, Kole Baje O. I'm a child of Africa, I'm a child of the drum. Mm. Also, I'm a child of New Orleans. Not New Orleans, not New Orleans, New Orleans. I'm old school, seven wall, hard head all day, right? I describe myself as a cultural activist, advocate and warrior. I believe that dance can be used for social change, okay. in addition to healing okay. and education. I'm not that kid that had ballet lessons. I didn't have ballet, I didn't have modern. My first introduction was through African dance. And when Kumbuka organized in 1981, we started in Greer Golf School of the Arts on Dryad come Street. On, come on, come on. So I have to just say, I represent that kid that might not get ballet classes or lessons. My introduction to dance was like, listen to the second line, come down the street, you know, and doing your thing. My mama didn't dance. She didn't pay for no dance lessons. Her thing was church and music. I, I played the clarinet. That's what I played, right? So, yeah, and I still know my embouchure, and I have an ebony clarinet. Not these plastic things that they have right now, I have an ebony clarinet. But I would just like to add to that. Um, for me, I don't look at my work in, I don't define it in terms of all of the institutional stuff. Mm. I define it as how do I interact with my community, yeah. which is why I take African dance into the prisons. You know, why I take African dance to the elders, because I feel that 
dance in America, African dance, is taken out of context of how it was used in Africa. It was a part of the community. And you know, in the United States, we compartmentalize stuff. You know, mm -hmm. this is dance, this is singing, this is that. So I just feel like with my work, I just felt like I wanted to do more. I needed to find ways to um, include community in what was being done. And not just as an art form to appreciate, but in a way to impact their life and to make it better. Because dance is a metaphysical phenomenon. It does change the atmosphere. Yes, when people dance, things happen, mm -hmm. right? You saw in South Africa where they dance, when they took down apartheid, things happen. Mm -hmm. We decided to stop City Hall from going to Congo Square. <laughs> we bought it down, right? So it's something about people coming together and movement and dance. And that's why the, the culture of New Orleans is so important. It is a culture of resistance. Yeah, it looks good and we dance with it, but it's about resisting the constant trauma and oppression that people of color face every day in New Orleans, but still survive. Mm -hmm. I told y'all this was going to be good. Um, all right, we're going to come around this side. <laughs> is, is it on? Can you hear me? So my experience is similar to Osetawa's. Um, I grew up in the civil rights home with my dad. Who was a civil rights worker. <laughs> and so... Um, my first experience with, I don't want to say knowing who I am, but with, with African-American history, I was in the fifth grade with Dorothy Moore. And she started telling us about Harriet Tubman and all of these people. And it opened up doors for me. And so I would go home every day as a little girl and tell my daddy, oh, I learned this one today and I learned that one today. And he said, seek, always seek because it's more. So my dad and I had the same fight, but our highways were different. He, along with Dr. King, put together the SCLC, Christian, Southern Christian Leadership Conference here. I joined the Black Panther Party as 14 years old, the youngest female member there. From there, being a part of the Black Panther Party, they always taught us that we had to educate ourselves. And it was very important that we get educated and pass it down. And so I did, I left here, I went to Jackson, Mississippi, attended Jackson State University, political science major. From there, I always had a burning feeling to dance because as a little girl, I would dance in the streets. And so as a teenager, I would always enter dance contests in the clubs and then the, 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 you know, the universities would have dances. And so I would always win those contests. But anyway, moving forward, I decided that I wanted to dance. I came back home, graduated with a BS in political science, and Greer Golf had a studio, New Orleans School of the Arts on Dryad Street, that a lot of people here don't know anything about. There, dancing with Greer in the ballet class, which I hated. And she would always fuss at Kevin Godin and I and tell us to stop talking in class because Kevin and I be at the bar like, we hate this shit. Why are we doing this shit? And Greer would be like, Mariam and Kevin, stop talking. And we'd be like, oh God. But anyway, from there, I found out about Kambuka. I joined Kambuka. From there, wanting to know more about my people and wanting to study in depth more about African people and their ethnic groups. I formed Kafo Traditional African Dance Company and Kulu Children's Traditional African Dance Company. And so my quest is to always tell what I call the untold stories of my people. Every year for the last 33 years, I've put on two concerts and conferences every year for the last 33 years. One is children, for the children only, and one is for the adults. So right now, and I need to talk to you, I'm in rehearsal for my upcoming concert in March, but I'm telling the story on The Wrestlers, 
you guys are familiar with Senegal, they have a big wrestling match, really, really big. So I'm bringing that wrestling match to life on the stage at Ashe. So my quest has been to tell those stories about my people that no one know about. And so I've done in-depth stories, in-depth study, I'm sorry, with my teachers about the different stories that are told or that they have in the countries of Senegal, Mali, and Guinea. So that's my quest. That's what I do. Okay, so the question was to describe your practice. And before I describe it, I'd like to acknowledge Miss Curry. She was very emotional when she started talking about her father. You will understand why I want to acknowledge the Curry family when I talk about my practice. In my practice is based on a lot of research from the perspective of Louisiana. The Curry family was instrumental in the civil rights quest of not only African American people in New Orleans, but throughout Louisiana. So the tears, and she doesn't talk about it, but when I was reading it, I, I was just amazed. And I have to give her family honor and credit for that. She also talked about New Orleans School of the Arts. So that was founded with a woman named Lula Elsie and myself. It wasn't just me. Lula was more dedicated toward the performing aspect of it with the company. I was more interested in the teaching aspect. Uh, immediately upon graduation from Xavier, Z Xavier University in New Orleans, um, Lula and I were gone. We began our, uh, another aspect of our professional training in New York. And at that time I said, but if I stay here, the level of where we need to be and what we need to do. Not that people weren't doing it. I'm gonna tell you another story about Zavi, the Xavier University, okay. um, is, is how, will, how will we move beyond what is just being done now? So just make it light and I'll tell you my perspective on my uh, training. So yes, yeah, Xavier University is where I took my first professional dance class. Yes, yeah, Xavier University offered classes in jazz dance in African based class. They were taught by a woman named Barbara Martin and another professor who her name, it's, uh, it escapes me right now. But Xavier University offered that because if you know our history, Xavier, the music department, they offered uh, operas every year. Mm -hmm. So therefore you needed a body of people who would serve as the core. So it was Xavier held the responsibility of training those people. So with, with that said, my perspective, and I'll make it short, I'm writing everything down. Uh, my perspective has evolved over the years. Um, it now includes music, research, and writing. It's from a, not my organization, we're talking about Greer. It is from a self-reflective perspective. So that means it includes my work based on my emotions personal experiences, professional training, and academic education. More importantly, encased in black culture, but dedicated to protecting and honoring that culture. With that said, it is very important that we understand or my work is always presented from a historical analysis of our collective experiences in the practices and in what I write. I have no apologies having been raised when I was raised in the 50s and in the 50s and 60s. Yes, flying into 70 here. Um, and I think that's, yeah, I don't want to go off. From, from, from the perspective of your practice, the practice is we're in New Orleans. I said, talked a lot about, you know, being a New Orleanian. We need to be clear that culture does not make people. People 
make the culture. So once again, I just, I, I'm honored. I want to take a moment just to, I mean, I hope you all feel the same way. This is it right here. I don't know how much better it can get on a Tuesday. What is today? No, Friday. Yes, yes, Friday, baby. Friday. Uh -huh. Don't push me back. Whew. But I'm honored, and I, and I love the thing that I'm picking up amongst all of the, um, you all as artists and practitioners is that this is a pathway, right? Dance is a, is a pathway and a modality for healing for black people. It's a, it's, a, it's a modality for reclamation of narrative and story and remembering. Um, and so it's all, you know, it contains all of these beautiful things, quite literally, metaphysically, somebody brought this up. It movement like disrupts negative energy right to move and to make noise and to shout disrupts um, and can change energy um, so it's all these wonderful beautiful things but yet as someone mentioned a lot of people don't understand the full history of uh, African or black dance or black dance leadership in the city and so my next question is what are some of the challenges that are currently existing in the dance community um, that you feel or that you faced as black women and as black leaders and black teachers? We'll start there and then I'll, we'll keep going from that point. But what are some of the challenges? I know, huh? Start first. That's because I'm, I'm short. I, t I don't talk as much. I'm going to get it out. No. Um, there's several challenges, of course, and it's, no, it's impossible to be able to list them all. Of course, finances always come up first as far as not me getting paid necessarily, but for my students being able to afford the space, the, you know, being able to take classes. I come from a generation where the arts were not necessarily lifted up. Um, it was extracurricular. It wasn't who you were. It wasn't a part of that. And and I had a very loving family. Um, it's just that that generation was coming from the perspective of you needed to go get a job. You need to work, right? And so it, the arts wasn't necessarily like anything to push. It's cool less than what you do or whatever, but it's not something that you would necessarily um, go out of your way to do. Um, that being the first stage of it, then another thing, of course, is what's, what defines a dancer is what I um, ran into a lot <laughs> in my, now, before I could even, before I had children, before I could even get into a good mama figure, I was told I wasn't shaped like a dancer. And so therefore, I would never make it as a dancer, like really, you know, I was muscular, I came from an athletic family, so, I was all muscle and to be told that I would never make it as a dancer. Um, when I clearly was dancing, <laughs> I was dancing, you know, um, that, that in itself is, you know, is heartbreaking. This is why in my particular companies, I create space for all shapes and sizes and for all levels of dance because um, I'm a more of an introvert. So, you know, being up here is hard for me to talk, but dance was how I spoke. That's how I was able to release and do things. So had I not been able to dance, you know, my, you, I, just the thought of not being able to dance, I wanted to create a space that made sure that people who wanted to dance could dance and it didn't matter, you know, whether or not you had the ballet back, background, whether or not you had, you were a size two, size four, size 16, it didn't matter, you know, um, because dance could bring forth that joy. So we have the finances, we have what defines a dancer, right? And then of course the spaces, um, acquiring spaces. So in order for me to do community work, and I want to create a community company or provide space for community itself. Back to the finance, one, how can I do that and offer my classes at a rate that someone can afford? Somebody has to pay for it, right? And then to be able to find the spaces that allow us to do that, where we either pay minimum 
and have a dance floor. <laughs> you understand? Because you can pay minimum. There's people who are who will offer you spaces, but it's now these harder floors. You know, um, you're on concrete, you're on tile, um, which I now know better. When I was younger, it didn't matter. I, I was good to go. But I feel that now, so I'm more cautious for the younger generation, and I'm constantly saying, hey, I know you, you feel great right now, but one day, <laughs> one day you're going to feel every concrete pounding. You can't train on concrete. You can't train on tile floors. So these are the three that come off my head you know, top of my head as challenges automatically, <laughs> financially, you know, what defines a dancer? We have to broaden that, that narrative out, you know, what, it is, what a dancer really is. And then the um, third one would be spaces. And even it, in community spaces, we have to protect the bodies of the dancers, the teachers, and, and for the longevity of dance. So is this your way of telling us we need the sprung floor at the ACC? <laughs> So, you've, you've we got already, wood, you, we got wood. You, you have wood, uh -huh, uh -huh. you have wood, and so that in itself, that's one of the decisions. So she's mentioning ACC because that's um, the housing space for um, Season Center um, for my dance companies. We're housed over on Bayou Road at ACC, um, which is Andrew, Andrew Kyle um, Center for Performing Arts, yeah. Um, and But we have wood floors, even our extra spaces have wood floors, so we can sh be shift and moved and everything and still have wood floors. So I'm, I'm in a happy space. Now, if you go ahead and get that sprung floor, I'm <laughs> you know I'm happy, but I appreciate the fact that we have a wood floor. And I have no problem with bringing my dancers, the young ones, all, all the way up to the, my um, older dancers, because I do have, um, dancers who are 70 and who take my classes, who are part of the company. So I want them to be able to dance as long as possible too. Yeah. Challenges, we're talking about challenges in the black dance community. Well, I'm gonna say this again, and, and she and I fall out about this all the time, I don't care. Um, I just want everybody to know that this sister here had one of the first dance schools in the city. And I think a lot of times, because people don't know the history of dance here, they feel like they created it. You didn't create anything. It was always here. So I want to get that clear with everybody in here. Um, I said play clarinet. I was a majorette for LC Foshe Senior High School, so dance started a long time ago. <laughs> We're not going to get into that. We, we're not going to get into that. In this way. In this way, um, for me, funding is a, a huge part of what I do. I do get funded, but it would be so much different, thank you, Allah, if I could get those kinds of grants that's, you know, 50,000, 40,000, those kinds of, of grants to really put my show on the way I would like it to be put on. I do applaud the, the, the artists who have helped me put my show on. They have done an excellent job. And a lot of times I could not pay them. And every year for the 33rd, 33rd year, I've walked away and didn't get one penny because it was more important to me to pay the artists if I could and pay the theater because I'm in the theater and nobody bothers me. But those things were more important than me saying, I'm going to take this grand. I've never been able to go on the shopping spree. I've never been able to buy a pair of shoes because damn, I did this show and it was good. And let me treat myself. I've never been able to do that. Yeah, I like shoes. I'm a shoe girl. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm just, <laughs> but anyway, I'm just saying, you know, when you get a little extra few dollars, you can say, wow, I did this show, it's over with. Let me go and buy me a pair of shoes. No, I've never been able to do that. Instant way. So being able to get funded to put the shows on on the level that we would like to put them on is very important. That the funding is really, 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 really hard. Um, also, as Kai was saying, being in spaces that do not, after longevity, ruin your body. I'm 67 years old. I'm still rolling, but you know, I've, I've I, huh? 
No, I, I do pretty good. I, I bounce up. I do pretty good. But, you know, I've had to train myself to make sure that I don't have those injuries. Like learning ballet, because ballet teaches you how to land on your feet. Um, like learning the different stretches and the exercises that this girl would give us in a dance class. But those, those lessons went on through my African dance experience in being able to teach people. A lot of people don't like to come to my class because they say I work them too hard. But that's how I was trained. You know, I'm at the bar and I'm bow-legged and this girl is like, straighten up and tuck in and look, I'm bow-legged and I don't have knock knees, I'm gonna do the best that I can do. But you know, those things helped with the longevity of us being dancers and knowing the different um, genres of dance and applying those different genres to what it is that we do. But the most challenging part, I would say, is funding. It is, is the funding and being able to put our dreams and our thoughts and our wants and needs on stage and being able to do it without stressing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm here. Well, I'm not going to repeat what they say because all that is, those are challenges. But for me, the biggest challenge for me because my choice of dance has always been African. And I find that there is still a resistance to African dance and its significance in the world of dance. Oh, yeah. they, they seem to think the technique is inferior or, it's, or that, that there is no technique, but it's the complete opposite. So I, that's a challenge for me, you know. Because when you ask somebody, show me African dance, they always go, oh, go, 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 go. oh no, like that. they do this one. Yeah. <laughs> but they always do this. And I don't try to make them feel bad. That's what they think it is. But it has so, so, it's so diverse. You can go to one, one city in one country, one region, and have over 50 different techniques of dance. So that's a big challenge for me. The second thing is uh, the community. And when I say community, I don't just mean black community. I mean black and white community not valuing us. They always go, Oh, can't y'all just take two hundred dollars? You got no. ten people. You want to pay people like ten, fifteen dollars? No, I, I can't even pay people for the rehearsal and then the performance. So I try to negotiate. Let me get them something decent for the daggone performance. And they still ask you, well, can't you come with something a little less? And then have the audacity not to have your money when the gig is over. So yeah. So that's, that's a challenge for me. See, I wrote mine. I wasn't texting you. I was writing my notes down on the phone. They probably said, look at her texting. Look at her texting, right? And so and the, my third challenge is maintaining dancers over a period of time. Me and Greg was talking about that over the phone. I, um, Kumbuka has always been a family dance company, meaning that the people who started out are still dancing today. Then you bring in other generations, right? And so we got the mama dance. I was going, let them, let them do the mama. Jaja, that's the mama dance, because it's the older ones doing it. And then you say, uh-uh. It is for the older women. It's OK. We are, she, she never likes to say we're getting older. We're getting older, Mariyama. We're Yes, we are. <laughs> At some point, you have to let the reins. You got you to gotta pass the baton, right? We going to still roll. They already say, what did Judah say? Mariam and Seth were well, gonna be dancing when they're 90, still trying to dance. But um, I just find that it's a challenge because as people grow, their lives change. Mm -hmm. They have children, they have schedules. And when you wanna have a rigorous schedule, say we got rehearsal two times a week, and people, they cannot come. So now I've become a, a company that is performance driven. So when we got a gig, then we rehearse. And then when that's over, that, they go about their business and they come back in together. I just wish I could recreate what we had back in, in the 80s and 90s because it was a true family vibe. The children were there. All of us was there. We was rehearsing not no one hour. We was there for hours. Then we would leave the rehearsal and go by somebody's house and eat. <laughs> it's like, don't you get enough of those people? But, but it was a communal. It was a family thing. And the final thing I want to say about space, all what they said is true. 
But the biggest challenge for me is finding spaces that artists can own in New Orleans. We do not own brick and mortars. We need brick and mortar spaces. And we have difficulty in getting funding to get the space. You know, it's like, if I had known, if I had a crystal ball, back when I bought my house, I wouldn't have bought a house. I would have bought a piece of commercial property that I could live on the top or the bottom and the, the business would have been there. That's what I would have done. If I had known when Katrina struck, I should have bought that property before Katrina hit. Because after Katrina hit, the prices went up. If I had known after the pandemic, the prices have quadrupled, I still can't afford them. And we don't have a city administration that values the arts. That's my other problem. We use the Indians. I'm an Indian queen. We use our indigenous culture to the benefit of the city. But we don't invest in it like we value it. And I have a problem with that. So I'm not saying that every Indian should own a mansion. I'm not not saying that but the same token we should have a space that is owned by us that's ran by us that's maintained by us that we can pass on to create a generational wealth in our communities and that's a big challenge for me that's that's my challenges other than that, I'm having a great old time I'm having a good old time <laughs> hmm um well first I have to say because of the work that my elders have done it's kind of made it better for the work that I've been doing. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful and humble for what the groundwork that you all have laid. I think uh, what are some challenges that we still face? I mean, it's funding. I was having a conversation with one of my dancers the other night, and I said, from 2016 to the time you've till now, do you feel like there's been an increase for you or economic advancement for you financially? And he was just like, no, there hasn't been. And so that's a problem for me as an artistic director, as a choreographer, I'm trying to figure out like what it is that we have to do in order to pull resources or to go from, you know, him going from a place where he first landed in the city in 2016 to 2022, being able to sustain living here as an artist, 150 per gig is not sustainable. And those prices have been in this city since they were started dancing. And that's still like a, a rate and a fee. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, financially, that's still a challenge, but also the knowledge that we have access to, like knowledge about how to write a grant, knowledge about how to do, how to do business with the city, knowledge about um, what is the language that actually needs to go in a grant so that we can get a $50,000 or a $250,000 grant. What are the um, knowledge about just having the, the, the access to funding for materials like film documentation or images for your company so that when you write the grant. So like all of this stuff, you know, I had to kind of find out just researching on my own, which presents the next challenge of there being more mentorship from the end of black, but being more mentorship for emerging artists in this city. Um, and, I, you know, I, I can't blame anyone on this on this panel because you all didn't have that knowledge or access to that knowledge. So in terms of mentorship, what do the elders need to know in order to be able to rally in the emerging artists to then share that information and those resources with them? Um, and so mentorship is has been a challenge. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I think I think I'm gonna pause there. I'm, I'm going to let you go, but I'm, I want to say something about what you said. Go ahead. Okay. So since we're on Tulane's campus, we can say in two words or three words, challenges regarding the arts and black women in the arts revolve around racism and gender inequality. That's just the bottom line. It's racism and gen gender inequality. Throughout my younger life, we were not given grants and even now because we were not considered the socially acceptable or the good Negro or the stories as I told you about my practice. It, it's not predicated on the romance that we often associate with dance in New Orleans. So you're not going to get funded um, because it's not liked. So if you're trying to do things, I found my personal experience trying to uh, bypass whatever excuses 
that those who use racist uh, pretexts to not fund you or to not support you. So I think that I've done everything, but that then becomes an issue because then you're seen as difficult. So you write the grant, the I's are, are dotted, the T's are crossed, Oh no, she's difficult. See, this has nothing to do. Yes, you're asking me for an explanation. You're asking me for why. And I'm telling you, this it's in full sentences. You don't want to do it. Going to um, Jarrell's point about um, the mentors, how can we, if we don't want, no, no. How can we, if we don't want to put you in a place of disadvantage from an association so I stay away, the association. So, um, and when I say racism, and I'm gonna not go delve deep into it here, I mean external racism and internal racism. I'll leave that alone. And I will only point to writing the grants. You have the opportunity. Most of the money is coming from some source of uh, federal funding or state funding. So you have the opportunity to then ask for the, the, the inadequacies of your grant. May I have the comments? May I have, what did I write wrong? A lot of people don't do it. I do it every time. You don't take it personally. I've learned not to take it personally. I've learned to take it as, this is what I need to correct. My, um, by the way, my um, footage of my work is not adequate. I've never, I've failed at that. I'm, I'm taking the onus on that. I've not been good at that. But the writing aspect, when you write and you get the comments, it's amazing. It ha it's so subjective. It has nothing to do with the work itself. It has to do with, it has to, <laughs> and I'm, this is personal experience. It has to do with Oh, yeah, she's doing a dance conference. They just got $20,000, so they don't need this. A dance conference, if I'm bringing in people from around the world and people from New Orleans, and I'm paying everyone industry standard, as Mariama said, we don't pay ourselves, right? You want to respect your artists, then yes, we do need it. We need to pay the venue. There's no venue we can go into free. We have, Sucrema uses Sanchez Center. I. To Kramer has to maintain a million dollar liability insurance policy oh, to be in that center. I have no, I, I, and I don't have any problem. The right side of my brain has no problem with that. No problem with that because, you know, things happen. And I want to be able to tell an insurance company, yes, okay, here, pay, or whatever. But a, a great example of, um, of that, and I gave you one. The young lady, we, we didn't get a grant. It was a small grant from the Arts Council. And I'm saying, and I can say it and say those words because it's public, it's public knowledge. You can, you can get it yourself. And the young lady, and it was a young African-American woman, they don't need this. And she's always talking about black this and black that. And, I, and I, what could I say? I can't, I, that, that's not an argument for me to have with her. She's a young woman. Even we talked about Nord, even getting the Nord facility to use it. So we had a facility and it's been four years, I'm gonna hurry. We had um, a, a building and the building needed a lot of work to accommodate all of the things Tikrema does there. So at the time, James Gray was the councilman. I called him and I invited him to the facility to see it, to give me directions toward who I should ask about renovations and funding and this and this. The councilman basically said, take your time with that. We have a state-of-the-art facility in your neighborhood. Just fill out the application and use it. Nord says you cannot use it. You cannot use it because we don't think you'll know how to use it. You don't have the capability. And we already have a partner and the partner is the partner. Okay, that's a great organization. They have dance classes in every North facility. Take nothing away from them, it's free, whatever. Ours are, is free too. And they said, whatever. So this is how you become difficult. I go in my back pocket and write a public records request. Please give me the city ordinance or the state law that says only one organization can use a city-owned facility. And I'm trying to do a legal 
a legal activity. It took a city council meeting to grant us a, uh, authority, to grant us the right to use that facility. And then, once again, you see how difficult? Why difficult? Because I'm writing a public records request? Oh, you want me just to go? Oh, because you're saying, oh, if you dance and if you teach dance, it will only be a building, uh, one of the rooms upstairs, and it has to be what the children do at the uh, parades. I like the parades, and I like, I, like, I like the dance teams. I do. But so, so again, it speaks to racism, and it speaks to gender inequality. So we're talking about dance teams. I'm going to tell you all about this one here. I always, you know, I always put on blast. Yeah, I put on blast. She was the one that created that little walk that the dancing dolls do for Southern. Yeah, she created that, the swag walk. She don't talk about it, but she did. I don't know if a lot of you people, you know, if y'all familiar with Southern University and the Dancing Dolls, but she created that. But going back to Jarrell's point, also a Setawa's point, that has also been a challenge for me, is getting people to understand, in a lot of instances, my African-American people, to understand that African dance is a art form. It is an art form. We are not the oogum boogum people jumping around on the stage to some drums or some bongos. No. That's why I study in depth to make sure that my stories that I put on that stage is correct and that the audience understands that this story is about the Wolof or this story is about the Bamana or this story is about the Sedea people. That's why I study in depth, because I know the negativity as an African dancer, as an African folklorist that I get. The other thing, Asetua and I, Gri and I, we've worked for agencies back in the day, going into schools, doing all kinds of shows, four and five shows a day. I'm talking about back in the day. We 67 years old now, so we was what? 20 something, 29, something like that, right? We were young. We was fine too, yeah. You know, we, we had it going on. And so now our children are doing those shows and they're paying them the same amount that you paid us. And I'm telling my son like, no, you're not doing that. I had one show and the lady got mad with me because I refused to dress in the dressing room, in the bathroom. I said, Shaka, pack up, pack up shit, let's go. Let's go. I'm not dressing in nobody's bathroom. I'm not doing that, I did that. And it's my job to teach the ones that's coming behind me to know this is what you asked for. This is how you asked for it. Because you're an artist, we did that. You're not gonna treat my son or Setua's daughter, Greer's daughter, Jarrell, whoever else is coming behind us the same way you treated us. Do not drain you no in no bathroom. I need a dressing room, I need parking. I need these things. Me and the people at Jazz Fest fall out every year. Where's my catering? <laughs> my kids work just as hard as Patty LaBelle do. So where's their catering? I need you to get the catering. And so yes, yeah, sometimes we do become difficult. I have been known to be difficult, but I'm gonna stand up for what I know is right. I'm gonna stand up, especially for the children. I'm gonna stand up for them. I'm gonna make sure that they have what they have. I'm gonna make sure that people like Jarrell, who are coming behind us, have what they need to have. Janice, have what they need to have. But at the same time, you guys gotta grow balls and you have to tell these people, nope, we're not doing it. I used to get shows all the time. I don't get them that much anymore. Why? Because you don't have my money. I'm not waiting for my money. I need to have my money when I leave off the stage. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. So a lot of times I don't get calls anymore. They used to bombard me for African American History Month. Bombard me, I don't get too many calls now, it's okay. Because you're not gonna treat me like you treated me 30 years ago. That's not gonna happen. So I was just gonna say, you know, it never ceases to amaze me how much um, a city 
that kind of, you know, hangs its hat on black arts, also doesn't literally make space for it, literally talking about the need for space, but also at the same time, something, you know, it, there's a commodification of the art that takes place, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no value attached to making sure that artists are paid sustain, in a sustainable way. There's no, um, there's no uh, work or initiatives to make sure that there are places in which the art can be made and can flourish, but we are gonna still commodify the art that's coming out of the space. So in what ways have you experienced black dance in the city, uh, African dance, uh, black art making, um, as commodified, meaning for consumption, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Commodified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you better go Taurus. That was Taurus. You ain't this to me? Put the Tauruses in the middle. Say that, say that question again. In what ways has, has African dance been commodified? <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 but it's always a, com I'm just, I need you to expound on the question. I know, yeah. Just, you just, just in a way that it's been used. Exploited? You want to say exploited? Exploited That's a better word. For consumption, That's but also not, you know, um, in a way that maybe doesn't recognize the history, the legacy, and it, it as an art form versus just a product. Well, I'm going I'm to cite two instances very quickly. The first, I got to go to my Mardi Gras Indians, my black masking Indians. It's a perfect example. Um, we spend the whole year sewing. It's no lie. We sacrifice. It's self-funding. We put our own money into it. And we put on the most beautiful show every Mardi Gras for free. We don't have no regrets about that. However, if a photographer takes our picture, because the law says if you're in a, you're in a public setting, it's, it's public domain. So they can take my picture and they can, it can end up anywhere, and that photographer can make big bucks off of it, and I'll not see a dime. I will say that there, there is a group of photographers here in New Orleans now who understand that inadequacy, and they're rectifying it. They, they will call you, say, look, I just sold this picture. I'm going to give you a percentage. I don't never ask them, well, how much did you get? The fact that they even call me, I'm, I'm moved by the fact that they even decided, let me just break you off a little something, something for it, right? I've had instances being up in Paris, big picture. It's like, what? Okay. Another example. Um, we were dancing, Kumbuka was dancing in Congo Square. And somebody took a picture, an action shot. Me and this little girl and other dancers and the drummers. I've never seen the photograph in my life, the actual photograph, but I have seen it on a national campaign that ran in Essence Magazine, Ebony Magazine, oh. RTA buses, yeah. billboards and everything. And I, I'm, I was like, never got notified. And this is the city of New Orleans. This is not somebody who just snuck away and did it. It's the city of New Orleans. And so how I got a poster of it, when Jackie Clarkson left the office, she, you know, she didn't run again. She left some things in her office. And because my background, you know, I'm, I'm a dancer and I teach it, but I also am a former NOPD employee, right? So a police officer who was assigned to City Hall said, I got something for you. I need you to come down here. I said, what you got? He said, I can't take you. Just come down here. Big old gigantic post of the whole thing. That's how I got a copy of it. I never got a copy of it. I never got notification of it. Never got compensation for it. So I think it's such a vast um, occurrence. It's kind of difficult to, con to, to, to police it. Like, how do you get together to, to, to moderate, to regulate how we don't get exploited? Well, I, for, no, no, I'll wait. I'll wait, I'll wait for you. So for me, if I'm at a, at a festival, I tell Malik, yo, they can't take no pictures. Who are these people? They can't take them. I, I just put a stop to it. Because like, like you're saying, we've been in situations where, you know, we go in theaters or we go somewhere and it's like, what? So what I do is I'm like, who are you? Who, is they, they with you? No, shut it down. And so people get upset. The other thing is, I think, is because the way New Orleans is sold to the world, mm -hmm. um, culture. It's a culturally rich city. 
And so a lot of people, when you, when, when you use the word culture, they immediately think culture, free. free. Right. right, so they come here and this, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going in Congo Square and I'm watching these drummers and dancers and Indians and Casa Samba and all these people and I'm gonna take these pictures. And so there you have it. Mm -hmm. And it's because the city, those that's, the powers that be in the city doesn't care about the arts or the art forms. And so they allow free reign. And then when we say something about it, then it's a problem. But I shut it down, like, yo, they with you? Yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah, so, so here I am, and I'll be difficult, you know, but I, 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 you know, I'm going to be difficult. So, addressing every, all of my, my distinguished colleagues here, um, in March, I'll be putting out a new body of work called Naked Appearances. It includes uh, a collection of essays, two short stories, some poems, and um, short writings called Hard Thoughts that are just my thoughts without evidence. But the collection of essays includes an essay entitled Shared Spaces, and it addresses the subject and the issue of copyright law and our right as community performers or people who are actually involved in what I call ritual in New Orleans, the effects, the consequences, uh, and I, at, I, at some point, I think it says um, the practices in New Orleans are, and copyright law are a mistake of law because they don't, um, they, they don't, they don't mesh. And in terms of the city, there's some things the city can do, but there's some things the city cannot do because I'm sorry, I'm, you know, difficult, you know, but it's uh, governed by federal law. Uh, <laughs> See, no, I'm laughing. This is it. See, she said, "How does she know that? How dare her?" No, I'm not an attorney. I'm something like a paralegal, or I just study it a little on my own. Oh, girl, you got a JD. Go ahead, on. <laughs> you got a big JD. Go ahead, girl. So, so, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's self self taught. But in regard to that, um, and and that's important. And and I would love to share it with all of you all. Oh, I was about to go grab my computer and read something from it, but I'm not. What I'm gonna say here about the commodification is the experiences that I've had as a black female artist in this city. So the first body of written, written body of work that I did was called Black Dance in Louisiana, Guardian of a Culture. And it's about dance from the social political environment of the dance practices and what has maintained it. In writing the work, the commodification of it and how we view ourselves, we're going back to the gender uh, disparity, uh, the, the gender discrimination and the racism, whether it's internal or external. And I hire someone as the editor and the first thing she says is, uh, did you get permission to write this before you started? And I'm like, Wait, the area code is 504. Is we in the United States? Can we write what we want? No, you need permission from, and she named the two people. And I just went, OK. Then she said, well, you don't have this. You have to have this, because the, the commodification is these myths that we have put in. You don't have this is the oldest black, and this is the oldest black. And I was like, well, I'm not really comfortable with that. Well, evidence and research and history, Philadelphia, Mobile, those places are older than New Orleans. No, you have to have this. And I'm going, because she wants me to commodify this work and tell a, 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 a story to just keep this myth going. And so I, I, I can't do it. So I, I'm going to uh, stop right there. I don't want to say, to, oh, no, i got to say this. So the commodification, the commodification, the one person who was like, I had to get permission from someone, she devises this idea where they're going to reduce second line steps to lab notation. And they were going to blah, blah, blah. It's not for me to say. You could do whatever you want. But I'm thinking, is this for notoriety on your part and this other dancer's part? What then? You know, yes, we have this culture, we have this history, and a big part of it, it is centered around an oral tradition, and you want to reduce it to lab notation. So how are you going to get the step from the little person who was born yesterday who is going to go out in second line the day after tomorrow? Let me see you get that step. And so you have to know where to stop. 
Mm -hmm. And in that same line of thought, I'm going to change this question up a little bit. Are there ways of performing, or I'm going to go even deeper, are there rituals that you have to think differently when performing them or doing them in front of black audiences versus white audiences? Can I go? I'll go first this time. <laughs> I've, I've been going less. I've been going less. I'm going to, and, and yeah, I, I, as I'm listening, I'm writing everything down. And I'm going to say, for me, no. Because everyone has a right to like, appreciate, and support the art they want. And as the artist, you have the right to create the art you want. I will just give you two examples. One, and I know she's going to come behind me, one is called the Ma'afa Visual Arts, mm -mm, Visual Arts Exhibit. It commemorates the Ma'afa. It is a visual arts exhibit for youth, six through 17. So the themes of their artwork has to be centered on African, African American, African diasporic art, history, and culture, or whatever they want to do in whatever the medium. That's the audience. That's what they're creating. Every Thursday night, I am teaching a pole dance class. Girl, I worked at pole that line. is not changing. We have a, a show, I haven't done it in a while, called Fulfillment of My Fantasy. It is an adult show. That's what it is. I'm not going to apologize or make an excuse for it. It is in context because I have children and grandchildren, so I'm not going to do something they're going to be embarrassed for. Some little boy but at St. Aug is going to walk up to my grandson and talk about me. No, so I'm going to, you know, it's going to be done with, with character. So the work and the historical work, I'm not changing it to appease anyone. You come if you want. If you don't want to come, I'll go to a ballet class. You don't have to change anything, girl. What, what you want me to do? Can I say pas de bourree? Turn my head? I'm, no, I'm respecting everyone's art and respect mine. And if you don't want to come, don't come. But pole dancing is an art form. Oh. Anyone else want to, just thinking about uh, ritual performance that would be performed, you feel more comfortable performing, or, or in thinking about commodification, I guess does it make it easier when ritual is then shared with white audiences in a way that allows them to summarize it in the way they want to summarize it and then figure out how they want to as sell a, it. As a, pra <laughs> as a practitioner of indigenous religion, I don't put ritual on the stage. If it's a ritual, that's for my personal stuff, the people that's involved with me, and that's what I do. Mm -hmm. now, if I put it on the stage, that's for it's anybody who wants to see it. But, but at the same time, the, I've learned from my teachers that some things you just cannot put on stage. Some things you just cannot dip and dab with. And, and going to Africa, I saw what they were talking about. There's just some things you just don't do. Um, I don't want to call the particular dance, but it was one of my teachers out of Guinea who brought this particular dance to the stage. Some things is not for the stage. Some things is not for everybody to be invited into but he put this particular dance on stage and before he can get home, his son had passed. And so I know the dance, I don't really do the dance because I'm like, mm, that says no, 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 no. So we have to know what, you, you have to do the, the studying and the research and the history to know what is good for the stage, what is good for allowing some people to come in and what is not. And so I follow that really, I follow that a lot. That's an interesting point in terms of black masking Indians because back in the day, um, uh, the tradition was really a male dominated secret society. You couldn't know the color they were wearing, let alone the design, right? And so as time has gone on, and we do know that traditional stuff it has to be flexible in order to survive. So sometimes things change, right? Uh, however, there is a split in the, in the black masking community because now a lot of the things that were secret are wide open. People are letting, they're sharing the sewing techniques and how they're putting the suits together. 
And there is a concern that if you keep giving it away, 50 years from now, you won't even see black people masking as Indians because somebody else is going to take it over. I keep telling you, y'all better hope the LGBTQ community don't want to do it because they're so phenomenal in their art. They're so fabulous in their vision. So I just think that I'm old school Indian. Um, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with my chief now for 17 years, but before that I was with Donald Harrison prior to that. So I'm kind of like from the old school. But the new school Indians are different. Why are they different? Because the sewing work is so hard and you need people to help you. It, you it's difficult to make a suit by yourself. You, you, you just need help. And so it comes a time when you just burn your people out. People don't even want to see you coming because they know you got a design. Can you sew this design? <laughs> because then you just need the help. I think that's one of the reasons why they're opening up. But there's still, there's a few little secrets that they, we're still holding on to that has not been made public. But that's, that's a growing concern amongst that particular group because now everybody know the color, they know the design, they know everything. They know where the practices are being held. The practices used to be kept underground with the, for the community. Now it's broadcasted. You go to social media, Indian practice at this, la, 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 la. And it's just a big old crowd showing up, right? So it doesn't become practice anymore. It becomes like a show as opposed to you actually practicing to hone your skill in. So I guess it's a struggle you have to always um, deal with in terms of the tradition surviving and maintaining that's that, yeah. that, that little thin line of balance is trying to maintain that balance in between them. So I have a thought on that, um, Mama said to her, um, a thought on how do you maintain a tradition, mentorship, intergenerational connection? Um, how is How does that work if someone who may not be in the sacred tribe of your community, but grew up in New Orleans and is interested in being a part of that tribe? Is it a, you know, what's the entry point for that individual that may have not been in that closed off circle? Because as, as you're saying, you know, it's gonna die off, right? Because nobody's sewing. So where does the mentorship, what is the access point? Is it a character thing? You know, does this person demonstrate good character in the community? Is it, you know, their gifting? What is that? I'm curious to know. Black people or white people? I'm talking about our people. Okay. I'm just saying because. Yeah, I'm talking about our people because you're, you're saying, you're, I'm hearing you as you're saying, you know, nobody's going to, but I think what is it that the elders are doing to, to again, pull those who may be in the community that's not necessarily in the family of what it, all, it is you all are doing, but is passing the torch or getting them ready for when you all want to just sit back and just not have for so, exactly so succession. For, so for Absolutely. me, you have to earn it. You have to earn it. Because with a lot of my teachers, I had to earn it. I didn't get African dance, like just, I had to earn it. I had to sit up all night long with the do's and the don'ts and here and you did this and blah, 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 blah. So now we're gonna pass this on to you. Now we're gonna entrust this to you because now we trust you, you've learned now. And so for me, I I'm the same way, I'm the same way. Everybody that come into my company or come into a class, it's some things I'm not going to give you because you haven't earned it. Mm -hmm. and, and earn might kind of sound a little rigid or it might sound a little disrespectful, but I'm going to sit back and look at you and say, hmm, are you really serious? Or, hmm, you're just here for your personal gain. Or, hmm, you're just here just to be here. Mm -hmm. So you have, to, you have to earn it from me because I had to earn I had to earn, with, with them African people, I had to earn it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, Mariama, and Jarrell, so I'm trying to put y'all to my responses to both of y'all's in one Do you want to hold this so, while you respond? Yeah. The one thing. So as far as the, the Indian stuff, to me, let me just be clear. I don't think it's going to disappear, but I do think, because number one, it's a calling. It's a calling. It's, it, it's something you just roll into, like, I think I'm just going to do this. It's on my bucket list. 
you know, it's, it's a calling because it takes such sacrifice. It's a self-imposed prison. Who wants to do that? I mean, you have to really be dedicated to do this thing, right? So I don't think it's going to die in that vein. It's just that some of the traditional ways, people not holding on to the tradition, because I understand that young people want to make their way, but I, you got to still stay rooted in the tradition for me. That's what I, that's, that's what I want to say to that. And as far as, um, Mariama, you was talking about um, earning it, right? So, and how people enter, right? Some people get it by birth, right? Like my daughter, I danced with her the day before she was born. They have a came out jiggling and dancing, <laughs> right? All of us, we were all pregnant. We all carried our kids. They, we danced the whole while. And what happened, it was interesting because when you hang with a group of women, y'all, see men, y'all know nothing about this. Men, y'all close y'all ear. But you know women, when women get together, your cycle starts syncing up together. When you, we got pregnant, everybody got pregnant at the same time. They say, is it in the water? It's just because we was all together. So it's no accident that our children came out dancing. What? I'm laughing. I said she keep pointing to me, but because <laughs> I'm not. I'm, but Naila, Naila, Naila had her daughter a week before mine or something. Yeah. So we did. It, yeah. it is like we really sing. I kept I'm like, why she? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, a week apart. Yeah, they're a week apart. And and to to answer your question, or or to speak on your question, um, I developed Cultural Ties Dance Festival, mm -hmm. and it's based upon all of the people who touched me, even though I came into the circle with my own group, I had the pleasure of dancing with Kambuka, um, dance with Mariana. I had the pe pleasure of watching in um, Mama Greer, Casa Samba. And for me, as I was going other places, because I'm self-taught, right? Which means that I didn't stay any one place and learn everything that I've, I've learned. I gathered it as I went along. But when I would go to different dance conferences that would have uh, black or African labels on them, I felt it still was very ballet based. They may have had one or two cultural dance classes that were part of it and in great conferences, but for me, I thought, okay, well, what better place to host a cultural di African diaspora dance conference? And it was, it's because of the people that touched my life. But then I have, talking about my daughter, I have a daughter. If I learn from my, um, from Mariama, if I've learned from Kumbuka, if I've learned from Casa Tama, and I am who I am. I want them to get it too, the way I got it, and then some. So for me, it's about recycling the energy and, and that they need to be able to experience it at, in, at the same level that I got it and then some. So we're focusing on, yeah, there's ballet, but in the same right, there's Dunham technique. In the same right, there's... Um, Haitian movement, in the same right, there's West African movement, the same right, there's Brazilian movement, and so that's my focus. So how do they, how do we get into these circles? It's by exposing them and making sure that they have the opportunities and that the local artists have the opportunity to say, we're still here and we're still doing the work, even as we, you know, change the landscape of New Orleans, that inheritance still remains. Oh, we're still here, yeah. yeah. And these are the ones who, who inspired me to do X, Y, and Z, um, who, who poured into me as I, as I was developing. You know, I've, 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 been, I've had my, my first group was Young African American Dance Ensemble, and that was created, Yadi, Yadi. in 1990. <laughs> it was, it's coming in. It's still a long time ago. <laughs> it wasn't 80 something, but it was like, because I had just graduated from, um, from uh, 35. And I went to UNO and I danced and I tried out for the dance team. This is how Yadi got started. This is why it has that name too. I tried out, 
I outdance. It was two of us. The other young lady was was black as well. We out we outdanced everyone there. She made it. She was a good friend of mine, but she was slimmer, and I wasn't. I was fine. <laughs> I've always been. I've always been built. Yeah. And so afterwards, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm like shocked when she said I, I wasn't on the dance team. Come to find out that's not even my style, but that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point. Um, I, and she, when she saw me coming and she braced herself, she knew I was gonna ask. She said, I knew, I knew you were gonna come up afterwards. You're just not, you're just not built for our outfits. That's why I didn't make it, because I, I did not have the outfit. I was not built for their outfits. They, so nothing is wrong with their outfits then. That they should, uh, you, know, you, you know, I guess, you know. Yeah, so right after that, after I, I did have a moment, because that's, that's, that's not the first time I heard it. Second, the, that, that was the second time somebody was able to tell me that to my face, right? First time was at NOCA. Yeah, the first time was at NOCA. I'm making A's. They're going to give me my grade that's due to me, but will tell my father at the parent meeting that I was not built for dance. You know, he's a black man, so he's upset. You know, and after a year and a couple of months of hearing that, you know, I get pulled out because I'm not built for dance and it's not going to be who you are anyway, so don't worry about it, right? But um, but for me, when I was told for the second time to my face that I would never be what, I, what I'm doing, I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and create my own. <laughs> and, it, and it was That's Joe African American Dance Ensemble. That's the story of, of a lot of creation yes. for black collectives and art making spaces. I do want to pause and make sure people in the audience have a question to I have the opportunity to ask you all questions. Um, so I don't know how we want to manage this, but yes. Do we need microphones for this? I can speak loud. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Melanie. I want to thank you all so much for the work you've done, are doing, and will continue to do. Um, I guess one of my questions, and you've touched on it in several different ways, um, are there any organizing efforts happening, particularly with city council, in terms of budgeting, especially since budget season is coming up? where we can start to like collectively start to advocate for more funding for the arts in the city and support for dancers. So we need to talk to you after. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, the city does have a fund now. Yeah, they, they what is it? The creative, uh, the cultural, the the economy, economy or something. Yeah. There is a fund now. I'm, you know, I'm going to give, give them the, the Cantrell administration. Yeah. That. that. We'll talk there, after. There, there, are, there are some <laughs> funds that are available now. I don't know the criteria because it's very vague. When you go to the website to get it, it's very vague on how to get it. But there are funds that have been made available to assist. But of course, it's not going to be enough. I have studied, I've researched uh, other, other models. The, the Malanga Center in Oakland. Mm -hmm. The city has given them a building. Right. They have like 10 companies in one building. Right. And, but they've been there almost 20 years yes. in that building. Yeah. But I just found out that they're just, the city told them that though all of those companies need to come together and form a 501c3 mm. so that they can deal with them, first of all. And now they're in negotiation with the city to create a co cooperative endeavor agreement and to, to begin discussions on the development so if you've been in there for 20 years, see, this, this is the challenges. They've been there for 20 years and they still don't have the building. Mm -hmm. And then you get other organizations, people just give them the building. Yeah. Yep. Jackson, yep. Mississippi, they there was a downtown the program yep. to give buildings for like a dollar. But you have to fix it. Like a dollar. Yeah. It's got some serious fixing. It's right. a lot of land in Jackson that they're mm -hmm. selling for. So that, that, so dollars. yeah, so yeah. that's the only thing that I know of. And, 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 and there, I will say this, post the pandemic, I've never seen so many granting opportunities given out to artists. What they call it, POC? POC. BIPOC? BIPOC? I've never <laughs> seen, I was like, I'm a BIPOC. Ooh, I'm, a, I'm a BIPOC. <laughs> so many, it's just, it's, but, but, it, but it's been a lot. And I will say this, to their credit, they relaxed 
the requirements. They yeah, relaxed yeah. having to have five hundred one c three and for this year. It was you just can so use it to pay yourself. Just, yes, it was very it was very lucrative. I I kind of thought it was like reparations for the black artists in New Orleans or something because it was definitely very not lucrative. Quite. Well, not quite, not quite. but I, but it was so abundant. So I have to acknowledge when things do happen, you know, and mm -hmm. and, and even in my life, in my in my, um, in my young life, I have to acknowledge <laughs> that I have been blessed. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I have received many fellowships. I've received hundred thousand dollar grants. I've I've gotten that right, but it's for the work. When I say I got that, I didn't get that. <laughs> Y'all know where I live at, Civil War in the hood. So I, I'm not. I can't take the money and benefit me personally, but I know what it is to get funding, but it's not consistent. Yeah. It's a one-time hit. You don't get it on a regular, consistent basis, right? So I'm, I'm, I am grateful for the opportunities that I've had. Um, I've been teaching at Tulane now. We always, what year did I start? Uh, I've been here since 93. That's right, that's right. You know, and and uh, and I, I I take my hats off to Tulane because um, number one, I was so humble by how I got the job. Um, I, I remember the day like it was yesterday. I was eating popcorn, watching the Golden Girls. <laughs> I, I remember it. And Barbara Haley called me on the phone. Hi, is this our set to I said, Yes, it is. Who is that? This is Barbara Haley. I said, Oh, hi. How you doing? And she said, We was wondering if you'd like to come to Tulane and teach. I was like. That's how y'all do this? <laughs> wow. And what she said to me was, we've been watching you. See, you don't yeah. ever know who's watching your work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and seeing how you deal with that. And from that one chance, that one opportunity, it opened up decades of teaching over here that I'm, I'm grateful for because it has allowed me not just to touch the lives of young people, but I have access to space. Kamuka can practice. Mm -hmm. I talk about space challenges. That's one thing that happens, right? I got to hang out with Carol, Barbara Pierre, <laughs> teaching that, uh, Afro Brazilian dance. Nicole Boyd, Monique Moss was here. You know, so that's 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 been good. I've been grateful for that. But the same token, I do recognize the void. And I'm looking beyond me. I'm looking. I'm looking when my daughter's going. I'm looking for my grandbaby. I'm trying to find where they're going to land. Mm. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about generational wealth. I'm thinking about what happens when I'm gone. Like, you know, I'm not going to really be gone. Y'all know that, right? Yeah. I'm, but I'm just saying. But I, I have to think about that. You know, you got Namdi, Greg has daughters. You have a baby. How old is your daughter? Nine. Nine years old, you know. And I, I, before we close, I'm just going to say this because I'm going to time. Uh, do, real quick, can I just answer? Because she was talking about organizing efforts. So um, I, I am a part of the um, Big Easy class, but also was for the dance committee. And so um, I think that there are some things that's happening inside of that beyond just the awards that they're going to try to like start organizing in terms of criteria, standards, and dance union. There was a dance union in New Orleans at one time, but then that was in 2011. But then it kind of like, I don't know what happened to it. So I think there are yeah, some black organizing arts efforts potentially. And if you want to be in on those yeah, conversations, like we would we'll love to like talk with you after and do all of that. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to acknowledge we did have a seat over here, um, space open because I thought about Bada Ringwa and how she too would have been a part of this conversation. So I want to acknowledge her presence in this space right now because she was also a forerunner as it relates to Haitian dance in right. this city. And then also too, I think about in terms of um, generational wealth, generational knowledge, I'm, I'm curious to know who is carrying that legacy right now in this city because right now she's gone, but who's carrying it? Chakra dance theater, nobody, right? So again, this conversation about like generation, like who is continuing that that body of work? And that's not to say any nobody up here is not. No, no, I'm not saying that saying. at all. We all no. are because I'm a product of her of her company. But I, I, just thinking of okay, who who are we rallying? Who are those people that are going to continue her legacy? So I just want to acknowledge by the ring white in the space. I'm from Lee. That's it. And that's what we have to be mindful of, that this moment mm -hmm. that we call life, yeah. 
you really can't take it for granted. You cannot. No, not at all. You know, stuff happens so quickly. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is your mark that you leave? What, how are you going to be remembered? How are people going to call your name? How are they going to think about you, you know? And I think about that. That didn't, that, that didn't always drive my work. I was, when you on the front line working, you just working, mm -hmm. you just doing the work. I chose to work with formerly inca incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. That's a hard thing because you're talking about women that serve life. We, we were able to get some out, but we still got some that's still in. So you're dealing with them and their families and trying to find ways through your dance that helps them to continue their fight. And I'm just so grateful that from their feedback, they tell me that the dance changed their lives. They were able to cope. They was able to serve their sentence and not feel like they was in a black hole yeah. by themselves, right? You yes, have something? No, I want to make a statement. You can do it. Oh, I just want to make a quick statement. Man. My name is Robin Beaver Carson, and I want to say I appreciate each one of you because I've worked with both of you on this panel. I'm an oral historian here in Louisiana. I do a lot of research. And what I appreciate about this is preservation. Yes. Preservation is very important. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying it because even through the work I do and reading history 300 years ago and looking at some of the contributions of what our African Americans have done here, if someone didn't document it mm -hmm. and wrote it down, we would not know. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is what I like to all of y'all to do when y'all doing your presentations, document it. Get somebody there to write it, to show it, to video it. Because if not, it's going to die, just like Body Meanwhile. Has anybody documented mm -hmm. her history, her dance? Or, that's what's important. Mm -hmm. And I just want to appreciate all of you. Like, how many people know that the first Congo Square Festival was held in 1984 in New Orleans with the commemorative poster being done by Curtis Pierre? Mm. Why did it continue? Funding. We didn't get the funding to continue. I mean, there's so many things that are, are oh, not yeah. known. You say don't wait on the funding, but after a while, you know, that gets kind of rough, you know? Yeah. It's only so much red beans and rice you can eat every day. Yeah. But, um, but also, I think the problem, too, is, and I have conversations with Osetua and Greer about this, and I am, gonna, I, am going to, um, I am going to tag the younger generation so but weird. no one tells you guys how it all started. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's no right. one tells you but guys that. Right. No, one tells you guys, but can I, but no can one tells you guys. But can I? Let me finish. No one tells you guys about. No one tells you guys about the Lula Elsies mm -hmm. and um, the Greer Golf Mendes and the, what was the sister we was dancing over here at, at Dominican? She oh, just she Pat Sylvain. Mm -hmm. No one tells you guys about her and how it all came up. Wow about and so those are the things that's very important that a lot of the younger generation does not know it was before mariana it was before Arsetua and kambuka right. it was before but that you talking about the historical aspect of it nobody talks about that and a lot of times nobody talks about it and can't pass it down is because you don't know no. so so I just want to be mindful too. I know it's time. I know. I feel like we just got to the real panel discussion. Um, but in a, in my in minding our time, I do just want to I want to end on this note. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get some more questions and comments from the audience. Yeah, bring it back. But I do want to end on this note. I always uh, like to end on a note of hope and joy. So in in one or two or three words. Um, what is your biggest dream for your community and specifically for when thinking about dance community? What is your biggest dream in one to three words? Oh, Lord. Well, just do it. Do it how you want to do it. Just, just. What she just, what we, what we were about to get into, the knowing and mm -hmm. the sharing of information mm -hmm. about the past. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go back to cultural ties. Again, I, it was developed with them in mind and my daughter in mind, mm -hmm. that concept of connecting. Have, it makes it a, a little teary because we need to know. I know, right? I know. And so when we invite you into our spaces, you need to tell us and you need to come and be there for that. 
Because we do appreciate. We do. Yeah. yeah. All. Every yeah. I appreciate. Mm hmm. Before, if I'm gonna go back to, I'm gonna go back. This to, is healing right here. Yeah. Women. Come on. See, oh, I've yeah. always had y'all. Oh yeah. Oh. oh women, baby. I've had two iterations of four women. This is a performance piece. I'm teaching children, but I bring them in because I want them to see them because they're inspirational. Because so, I can still wear my costume. It, oh. <laughs> it's time to bring it back. <laughs> bring it back. I still but I, but, but that's, that, that, that's what I would leave this concept of making sure we're creating space for that to happen. Oh, yes, yes. For the sharing to happen. Yes. Sherelle? Intergenerational connection, sharing, mentorship, economic advancement for my people, healing. Well, they're going to say everything I want to say. So what I'm going to say, what I need for my dancers, what I need for the dance community, I need them to be able to exist in a good space. So I need the streets to be fixed. I need the crime to go down. <laughs> this is real because if you can't be, if you can't live right, you can't create. So I, I, I want my quality of life in New Orleans to be better. I just want my quality of life to be better. I just want my trash picked up, my streets. You know, I just want those things that I deserve. I deserve that. And when we all have that, then we create better. Now, we do know that creation comes out of stress and frustration, but I don't want to do that. Because I want to, yes, I, I, I want that. I want that. In addition to whatever else that they're going to come up and say, I want a safe, clean environment. For us to create support 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 um I, I think for me it's very important that we support each other's endeavors that we show up to each other's shows a thousand times i've tried to put an organization together and i'm gonna go back to this where people who came into the city who felt like there's no dance here, wanted to create no dance been here before you got here. So I've always tried to put together a organization where I felt like we should be the welcoming committee to these yes. people yes. who felt like I'm yes. gonna bring dance here to right. New Orleans because there's no dance here, excuse me, it is. And that was one thing about Arena before she passed. We had our little meetings. The Black Diaspora Culture Collective yeah. to actually do that. The ain't about Arena. You need the mic. Come on, stop. <laughs> I think the word is ma'at. It's balance. It's respectability, and mutual respect and responsibility. Um, when we talk about the dreams and the dreams of Tikrama, the organization that I run. The current, I hope I can maintain the program that we have for youth past 11, past, sorry, past April, or to reinstitute it again in September. And that program speaks to uh, safety, it speaks to um, economic sustainability. And it speaks to the education of our children and passing that knowledge and information on. Um, yeah. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause for our panelists? Can we give a standing ovation for our panelists? You know, we ran out of time. We got two. Thank you. I'm going to pass it back over to Dr. Proctor. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, Everyone who's attending, thank you. It feels just like I want to sit there and my hands. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have now grown to the point where it's my job to say, we got we have appointments, I'm taking y'all to lunch. <laughs> we have reservations. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for being here. Dr. Frey. I want to give thanks for New Orleans Center for the Go South for you all being here. I would love to have you all again. And if, attended, if you are not familiar with our programming, please sign up for our newsletter so you can see more great events that we have coming up. We actually have one next week about Chinese immigration in Mississippi. It's called Far East Deep South. There will be a film screening at 6 in the Stone Auditorium right across the quad here 
Um, and we will also have a conversation with uh, the co-producer and the protagonist of the film, Baldwin Chu, who's coming down with um, communication professor, Dr. Jerome Dent. So whenever you're ready to bring us back, just give us the date and time. There are two other things that I do need to mention today at the end of the month, between February 23rd and February 26th. Um, the Tulane University Department of Theater and Dance, in conjunction with the Folger Theater, the Folger Shakespeare Theater out of Washington, D.C., is hosting uh, the Racing Shakespeare Festival, where we look at the intersection of race and Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, need to mention the We Will Dream Festival. Oh, yes. That is only May I ask just a quick question before everybody leaves? <laughs> Sorry. But, um, <laughs> I want to see round two, too. But who else would you all like to see with you? Monique Moss. Yeah. Uh, Carol Pierre. Yes. Carol, Carol Pierre. Pierre. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lula Elsie. Yeah. Yes. Yes. She was invited. I don't know. <laughs> 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 she was invited. <laughs> All right. Thank and for the great work that y'all will be up here. Thank y'all so much. Yeah. We are on the call transformational equity building Let's capacities go. with buildings and with endowments. Yeah. So y'all yeah. well, yeah. 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 control yes. that in y'all organization because that's what each of you deserve. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, right. it's, it's, it's in the works. Yeah, it's in the works. So buildings yeah. and endowments, so y'all can control y'all own reform and people yeah. will be coming to New Orleans. Seeking you out. Yeah. That's right. This, this auditorium should be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.